I will now uh, call our meeting for Wednesday, January 24th to order. Welcome to the PBUSD board meeting. We have translation if you need in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Urania Lopez. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva de PBUSD. Disponemos de traducción en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte Urania Lopez. Um, okay. If someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, please have your speaker card completed um, prior to that agenda item being brought up, and please hand that to Eva Renteria, and each speaker will have two minutes to an item. I also see that we have a lot of new faces here tonight, so I just want to take a moment to establish some ground rules. Um, there may be differences of opinion, sometimes strong differences. Please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business. So I will now move to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask uh, Vice President Soto to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Trustee Soto. Now we will now move to item 3.3, .3, our superintendent comments, and Superintendent Murray Sheckman um, will start with a few comments. Thank you, President Acosta, and I appreciate the presence of everybody in this room tonight. This is democracy in the best form. I have two brief announcements. One is related to phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, not the standard kind of phishing that people get sucked into with email, opening up the wrong email. A small number of teachers yesterday received a text from me saying, please go out and buy some Apple uh, uh, cards, gift cards, because I'm going to organize an event at your school and we're going to celebrate. So I spoke to Mr. Weiser, who gives me the good info that people are using our website to get the info. So they get my name, because the superintendent's name is going to be on every website, and if teachers, for whatever reason, are putting their own phone number on, that phone number has then been used to get the text. So uh, four or five teachers wrote me. They were smart enough to know that I wasn't asking for Apple gift cards. But one of them did wonder and thought, hey, is there a celebration at my school later? She was kidding. So just I'm written all of them back and said, please, if your phone number's there, take it down, use Google Phone to, to communicate with parents. And my second announcement is I'm following on uh, Dr. Farah Sabah's lead. We have a number of resolutions over the course of the year, and we're going to honor counselors as one of our resolutions tonight. But one group that isn't being recognized, and the County Office of Ed was uh, the superintendent recognized, is the people who run for office and serve. And sometimes they get beat up, sometimes they don't, sometimes they're treated with love, but they ran for office. They're representing the best that we have at the local level in democracy. And I want to thank our board, and I really appreciate it, that you ran for office. You're sitting here almost every other week. We fill the room. Sometimes it's a little tough, but thanks for your service. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. A little round of applause for our board. And then my final comment, I'm not looking for a pay raise. I'm just an interim. So I didn't need to butter them up. I really want to honor democracy, and that's what this is about. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Sheckman. And moving on to item 3.4, governing board comments, um, reports on standing committees. This is the opportunity for each board member to take a few minutes. And we will start at the end with our student trustee. Oh, thank you, President Acosta. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say it's uh, really exciting and good to, it, I'm really excited to start this new year. Um, I hope everyone had a very west, uh, restful winter break, and I hope um, all the students end the year strong. Thank you. And we'll just move down the line. Trustee Bolano Scal. Thank you, President Acosta. Welcome, Happy New Year, everybody, and to everybody watching. I want to thank 
by start by thanking our IT team who helped me get back into my email today very swiftly. I called the general hotline, boom, got a phone call, so thank you, Mr. Weiser and your team for being so excellent. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about the superintendent, who the new super, how that's going, what a surprise. Uh, we have a special board meeting next week to talk, uh, look at applicants is my understanding and uh, maybe fine tune our process. It is my opinion that this is a huge decision that's going to affect our district and I think it would behoove us to have some finalists meet with some of our key staff members. And I'm just going to say that publicly, you all know it, the world watching, that is my opinion and I hope we can accommodate that to make sure we get this decision right. I'm also excited about Superintendent Schechtman leading us in a declining enrollment slash looking at the budget. Can we make positive changes in order to ensure that we pay our staff competitive and living wages? That has been a priority for me and I think it has been delivered by this board in the past year. So, but. We need to keep doing that. So thank you, Superintendent Checkman, for your leadership and to our board. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so I attended our, our, PV, our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation and um, Santa Cruz Arts Council meetings for our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation. I just want to let folks know that we'll be holding a fundraising dinner event at Jalisco's on April 18th at 5 o'clock. Great food. Um, great auction items and it's a chance to support scholarships, grants and initiatives like you know our CTE uh, tiny homes uh, projects. For Arts Council there will be a number of um, family arts nights for the month of March so keep an eye out for the exact dates and locations. They are great events, great family events. So. Thank you for coming tonight and Happy New Year to everybody. I attended the DLAC meeting last night, which was um, always well attended by um, parent representatives from each of our schools in our district, and it's frankly the best meeting the district runs. It's, so, it's such a beautiful meeting. There's always children there and dinner, and people are most important stakeholders giving feedback to the district, and it's just nice to see the governance in the room. So thank you to those of you who were there. and. Um, and I hope we have a good board meeting tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to 2024. Uh, I just want to quickly say um, thank you for everybody's here tonight. Thank you to our board. Uh, we have some challenges coming ahead in 2024, but I'm proud and honored to be here, to sit here, to represent the city of Watsonville. And I would just like to say thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for being here to keep things going quickly. I just want to say Happy New Year, and I hope we have a great second semester. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's my first meeting uh, in this seat as VP of the board. Um, honored to serve in that position. Uh, excuse me. Um, so just a couple of reminders, or a reminder, the CCS uh, wrestling uh, championships will be uh, taking place this weekend in Watsonville High, so come out and support. Uh, I will be there myself assisting with whatever I can. And uh, just an update, I know I've uh, mentioned Elks offering some scholarships um, through our local lodge there, and uh, as of now we have eight applicants. So thank you for uh, reaching out and applying. And everybody have a good night and a happy new year. Thank you. And I'll say um, welcome again. I'm glad to see everyone here. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, in spite of having some vacation time off, uh, we've had a lot going on in the district. We've had our Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting with um, our fellow folks over at the city of Watsonville in December where we discussed many important things and not limited in including um, also issues and concerns around flooding. Um, as tr you know, which is a very important matter, which is going on with rain to consider. Um, and Trustee um, Soto and I, both our areas were the most heavily impacted last year. So having that collaborative relationship and being on the forefront of things and being um, prepared and ready is really important. We also had agenda setting committee 
um, which we had determined tonight we needed to start a little bit late. And we're sorry we were still late at a closed session, but we had a very packed um, closed session meeting. And um, thank you again, Superintendent Sheckman, for your comments um, and recognition of myself and our colleagues on the board. And very appreciative of that. Also, really quickly, I just also wanted to note that this um, weekend, um, my husband and I had the pleasure of attending uh, the Santa Cruz Symphony right here in Watsonville at our very own Mellow Center, where it was just an absolute pleasure and an outstanding performance, and including our own trustee, Bolano Scow, was up there um, performing as well. Um, it, but it was very uh, an enjoyable experience to attend and to have it at our Mellow Center and to hear a lot of positive feedback about the acoustics in that building. Um, and what we're doing and continue looking forward to continuing that conversations of what we're doing there and got to and I got the pr pleasure to interact also with one of our very own Watsonville High School students who was in attendance and it was his very first time attending the symphony and he was in absolute awe and amazement so um, looking forward to continuing those conversations with those folks. Um, so moving on to item 3.5 do we have any high school student board representatives here this evening to present or any that are videoing no, in? No, okay, so we will move on from that. And the next item is 4.1, the approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Um, next, we will move on to item 5.1, approval of the December 6, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, it passes 7-0. Approval of the December 13, 2023 organizational board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to approve? I move to approve. Second. I have a first and a second. Um, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to 6.1, public comment. So again, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that through the Brown Act, the board is prohibited from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, but please do know that we are listening. Do we have any public comments for 6.1? Uh, yes, we do. We have 17 speakers tonight. Um, we'll call you in uh, groups of three. You step up to the podium and uh, use your two-minute session. Uh, the first three speakers are uh, Mink Brooker. And please correct me if I mispronounce your name. Gabriel Barraza and Maximiliano Barraza. Thank you all, everyone who's here. I'm grateful to be here again, and I want to first say thank you to all of you all who supported Pajaro Valley High School for our first annual Ruby Bridges Back to School. Last November, it was an unbelievable success, and I'm very grateful for all of you who supported us. I have here with me today our uh, president of our Black Student Union at Pajaro Valley High School. Again, I have Mr. Sean Miles, who comes from the Santa Cruz County Office of Education to support our Black Student Union meetings. And I think everyone knows who Ms. Martha Vega is, a wonderful colleague who has come here to support. I just wanted to share with everyone that a week from tonight, the Martin Luther King Convocation will be held at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium. I've been blessed to be a part of that when I used to teach at Seaside High. And I have to tell you all, when they see high school students there, they call their names out. But that's not the only reason that I'd like to go. I'm very happy that we have been offered the invitation to go. We're trying to get some buses and vans because we have a lot of students and a lot of teachers who'd like to attend. But I wanted to announce it tonight for anyone else 
It starts at 6 o'clock. It's free. The program begins at 6.30, and the speaker will be none, on, none other than Chef Bryant Terry. This is the 40th annual Martin Luther King Convocation, and Santa Cruz has been doing this for quite some time. Two of Martin Luther King's uh, children were speakers, and many of the speakers have been men and women who have actually walked with Dr. King. So I was happy to be able to come here and share this. Is my two minutes up yet? I just want Zaina, our president, to say something. Just say hi. Hi. Just say hi. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you guys could hear our issues. Okay, that's time's up. Thank you all, everybody. <laughs> you said it. You did it. Um, I want to say good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Maximiano Barras Hernandez, and I am a student at Pajaro Valley High School. I was displeased to hear about the failure to renew Dr. Quintiango Cubales' contract. I'm sure you know how important it is for teachers to receive the correct training so that they can do their jobs as efficiently and effectively as possible. As a matter of fact, I am very pleased with the curriculum I am receiving from my ethnic and literature studies teacher, Ms. Fantham, at PV. It saddens me that teachers won't be able to get the training necessary to give the stu students the tools they need to succeed in society. Sure, it's possible to go with a different consulting firm, as President Acosta wants to do, but can you guarantee we will receive the same level of expertise that Dr. Quintiango Cubales brings? Let me illustrate the most likely outcome of your decision with an analogy. Imagine you want to build a house. You contract builders to start building the house, and once they have a foundation set up to actually start building the house, you fire your contractors and contract new builders to complete the work that has been done, leaving the house wonky and unstable as the new contractors you hired have a new way of doing things. I don't want the ethnic and literature studies classes to become a wonky and unstable mess because of your decision to not renew the contract of a renowned expert. Instead, you should base your decision on the words of everyone who has worked directly with Dr. Quintiango Cubales, who have attested to her professionalism and dedication to ethnic and literature studies. This is why I am here tonight, to implore that you reinstate her contract and not halt the wonderful progress we have made in our district as a result of her support and expertise. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Gabriel Barraza. I'm here to urge the members of the board to place the renewal of the contract with Community Responsive Education back on the agenda and reconsider their actions of September 2023. I am the father of two PV, PVUSD students, one who is currently taking Ethnic and Literature Studies and one who will hopefully be taking the class next year. I was not able to attend the meeting in September, but I have gone back and viewed the discussion after the hearing, hearing that the contract was not renewed. I have spent considerable time looking at both our local situation and the larger issue around diversity in education. The push not to renew the contract is part of a larger attack on ethnic studies and other empowerment curricula by right-wing groups who have mimicked the language of oppressed groups to try to restrain any curriculum that challenges existing power structures. It disappoints me to no end that some of the members of this board whom I respected allowed themselves to be fooled. I know that, some, I know that there are people on the board who have come with the agenda to halt progress under the guise of think of the children. I am disheartened that others have accepted right-wing talking points and advanced baseless accusations. I know that Trustee Soto, though he had misgivings about some of the accusations made, was able to look beyond the politics, understand the benefits of the framework, and move to renew the contract. I thank him for his courage. Trustee Holmes also seemed willing to view the situation through the lens of effective education. And Trustee Bolano Scow had some promising questions and feedback, but unfortunately did not take any effective action. 
Some members of this board have halted two years of progress in our high schools over unsubstantiated, politically motivated attacks. Again, I hope that members of the board can show some courage and leadership and put the contract back on the agenda. Thank you. I'm sorry, that's our timing system. Can you please call the next three? The next three speakers, please. Zahir Sabah, Bobby Peltz, and Takashi Mizuno. Members of the board, Superintendent Sheckman, and members of cabinet. As a member of the countywide student organization, Youth for Environmental Action, and as a PVUSD student, I wish to address a matter of significant importance, the need for our school district to declare an official environmental emergency. This is not just a plea for action, but a call for our educational leaders to align with the urgent realities of our times. We have witnessed the de escalating impact of climate change, from devastating wildfires to floods, and it is imperative that we respond proactively. In this context, I urge the board to officially declare this emergency, signifying our collective commitment to sustainable practices. In your search for a new superintendent, please find a leader who is not only aware of these challenges, but is also a dedicated advocate for environmental sustainability. Someone who would integrate green practices into our schools, operations, student learning, and one who sets an example for students and staff alike. An immediate step we can take towards this goal is implementing a district-wide composting program. Such an initiative would serve as a practical demonstration of waste reduction and environmental stewardship, reducing landfill contributions <clears throat> and enriching our school's gardens. As students, we are not only learners but future stewards of our planet. Incorporating sustainability into our education is essential, preparing us to face the environmental challenges ahead. By declaring an environmental emergency, prioritizing sustainability and leadership, and adopting practices like composting, our district can lead by example, inspiring both current and future generations. In the name of those that have trod this earth and lost their homes and lives, we draw the line in the dust and say environmental action now, environmental sustainability tomorrow, and environmental justice forever. Thank you. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> Bobby Pearls, Washingtonville High. I'm here to once again speak on the CRE contract. This is now the seventh time that I'm speaking on this issue as I've spoken at every single board meeting since the CRE contract was not renewed. When I first spoke on this issue four months ago, I invited you all to, to visit my classroom and to come talk to me about the program. To see the work that we do and be assured that your fears of anti-Semitism are unwarranted. But the only two people that have taken me up on that offer have been Mr. Sheckman and Trustee Dodge. And while I'm so grateful to both of them for taking the time and showing their support, Mr. Sheckman doesn't get to vote. And Trustee Dodge is only one of seven. So since you haven't come to talk to me, I've come to talk to you every single meeting, two minutes at a time, seven times in a row. That alone should tell you how important this issue is to me. I'm immensely proud of the hard work that we've done and the program that we've built. Professionally, it's the best thing I've ever done. I love ethnic studies. And so I've done everything I can think of to get you to bring the CRE program back and to apologize to Allison, to show that you support what we're doing. I've invited you into my classroom. I've vouched for Allison as a person. I've joined the ethnic studies team in submitting a letter. I've pointed out the facts and the evidence that uh, refute the claims of anti-Semitism. I've joined 1,600 other people uh, signing a petition, and I've asked community members to come out and speak their expertise. What else would you have me do? But I'll tell you what I won't do. I won't give up. And so for the seventh time, please bring the CRE contract back, approve it, apologize to Allison. And I'll see you in three weeks. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm wearing two neck necklaces tonight. One is Orone, and the other one is Chumash. 
PBUSD committed desecration of an Indian cemetery when Lakeview Middle School was constructed in early 1990s. When they were informed about the, about the existence of the Indian cemetery, the board told an Indian leader who put his efforts to preserve the burial site to pay $300,000 to redesign and construct a school if he wanted to do it. How could anyone pay such an amount of money? Moreover, PBUSD asked him to give a blessing. He refused to do it. This story tell, tells us how the PBUSD board at that time was insensitive and disrespectful to the Indians. I share this story with you tonight because what the board has done against Professor Allison, CRE, and us since last summer is similar to our eyes. We urge the board to correct the mistake in a proper manner. Thank you. All right, our next three speakers are Bernard Gomez, Chris Webb, and Karina Moreno. Tlapaloa Juan, Kuali Yowali, Inoshime, Manotoka, Bernard Gomez, Naniewa, Watson. You know, greetings, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Doorway in, doorway out. My name is Bernard Gomez, born and raised here in Watsonville. Uh, you know, the importance of learning about your identity, right? Learning about your culture. You know, for a long time, you know, I just, I was regulated just to a Mexican, you know, to a Hispanic, you know, labeled Latino, right? But no, I began to learn about my indigenous identity, right? I'm Cahuilteco on my paternal side, and I'm Cascan from Zacatecas on my maternal side, right? And I say all that because <clears throat> learning about myself too, I've also began to, uh, you know, um, accept, you know, the, uh, the trespasses that I've committed, right, against my community, and the uh, trespasses my community has made upon me, right? Um, I've also been on the side of uh, being denied due process, right? And that's what I've seen happen on September 23rd, I want to say, with uh, uh, denying the contract of Dr. Allison, right? Again, this board was, did a, voted not from factual research conversation, but just from an emotional standpoint, right? Um, and to me, I think that's, that's, that's not democratic, you know? That's not part of what we do. You know, we have these conversations. So I implore you, ask that you bring back that agenda Right, bring back that item, have discourse, because the students that's that's what they're asking for, the parents that's what they're asking for, you know, and thank you for your uh, time. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Um, congratulations to Trustees Acosta and Soto in your new positions. And um, I wanted to express my appreciation for something Trustee Scow said at a, a recent board meeting. It was about um, the issue of non-attendance and how we should really um, address that and take that on. And I 100% agree. I've been waiting for um, leadership to, to do this. And there's a couple ideas I have related to that. Um, one is related to something um, our assistant super of secondary said last semester as well, talking about assessment reforms. And I would specifically reform how we do the um, edgenuity assessments and just make it so that it's proctored in person. I think that would help to make sure that students, yeah, you really are responsible for truly learning and you gotta do it here in person. You gotta actually attend. Um, I would also uh, like to say that I appreciated district leadership um, talking about SEL. I feel like if we embrace that, that is also like um, a strong foundation with which to bring uh, students to school. So with that in mind, I wanted to make sure the um, 
the data that the Renaissance Student Leadership Group collected of the student body and of the staff, um, the, you saw that, site council just saw that, and that can help you to see like what's gonna actually get kids excited about coming to school. So um, the things that they had, there was, a, there was a survey, it was 54 respondents, and we had 38 students, 13 teachers, or, or could have been um, 13 certificated, three classified. The top priority was about um, mirrors and doors in the restroom, and there was a second highest, so the top priority was that second highest auto shop, and again, the restrooms. Um, the third highest was connection to SoCal Creek Water, which I, I understand is in the works, um, and then the, the, the restrooms came up again. Students need to feel safe. If you don't feel safe, like if you're probably not gonna learn, and if students are always not using the restroom during breaks, they'll do it in class, which is not conducive to learning. Thank you. Hi, buenas noches, my name is Karina Moreno, and I am here supporting the students, the parents, and the teachers, trying to bring back the CRE contract, and at least taking up the teachers up on their offer of like getting their perspective on it. What is it that they're actually teaching? Because I also was able to watch the September 13th meeting and it was hearsay and it was fear mongering and, and it was a lot of emotion. But I'll, I'll tell you too, like growing up here in Watsonville, going through all of PVUSD my entire life, I liked it, I loved it. Um, but I didn't learn about myself or my history or my culture through school. It wasn't until it was I was in my 20s and I can't tell you how empowering it is as a Chicana, Mexicana, indigenous woman to actually know who I am and actually know who I represent, who my people are and who I'm bringing into all of the work that I do. And I'll also tell you, I have such an honor to be able to do that with a lot of the youth here in Waltonville and to remind them who they are. And let me tell you how empowering it is for them to actually be able to look people in the eye and bring their ancestors into the forefront. And to, to think, like I wanna have children here. I wanna grow my family here in Watsonville and hopefully send them into PPUSD. But I would hope that they would they would not have to hide themselves, that they would actually get to bring themselves to the forefront, and that if you guys think of them and think of the children now and the ones in the future who, who are growing up here, and giving them that opportunity, and at least looking into what it is that the teachers are trying to bring forward before dismissing it. Thank you. All right, our next three speakers. Uh, Nat Lowe, Elias Gonzalez, and Eli Davies. Hi, good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. My name is Nat Lowe from Aptos. Um, it's now been three and a half months since the Board decided to throw away a successful investment in the district's ethnic studies program based on a still unsubstantiated claim of anti Semitism. And that decision seemed less to do with the actual content of the curriculum and more to do with the board's fear of voting for something perceived as controversial. And I want to say that many of the issues that are the most important are always going to be controversial. And the board's job is to do what is best for the students. And I've seen this board do that before. Last year, you boldly and unanimously voted to declare October as LGBTQ History Month here, which is a controversial decision in the current political climate of increasing anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. But you took this stand because it was what is best for our students. Because uh, in, your, in your resolution, you, you recognize the importance of having LGBTQ history celebrated in classrooms because that makes students feel seen and valued. And as a queer and trans person who did not feel seen when I was growing up, I very much applaud and appreciate that. And I ask you to have that same courage in centering our students' best interests when it comes to ethnic studies. Two years ago, the board made the bold move to work with community responsive education, which is called that because it helps to, the teachers to center the histories, the culture, and the experience of students' own communities in their ethnic studies curricula. And you made this investment because, again, you recognize the importance of having students see themselves and their communities reflected in their lessons. It helps students feel seen and valued and empowered. And all the evidence has shown that this has been a fruitful investment 
students are thriving, teachers are supported in developing their lessons, and there's been meaningful partnerships um, with Watsonville and the heart. And so to throw that all away because of a controversy that's still not backed by any evidence, even three months later, is really harmful to our students. And I, I urge you again to, to act in boldness rather than in fear for our students' best interests. Please put the contract back on the agenda and vote to renew it. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Um, my name is Elias Gonzalez, currently residing in District 5. Uh, I come to you today as a former PVUSD student. What's up, Mr. Shuckman? Uh, who also is a father of two former PBUSD students. Uh, I'm also a concerned community member who has worked in local nonprofits for over 20 years uh, with communities that have been systemic, uh, with systemic inequalities. Uh, it's always tough to come up in these spaces because there's so much to say and always so little time to say it, right? Um, but to be honest, I never truly be, feel heard in these spaces, right? Uh, a lot of times I feel like these spaces are spaces that quiet the community. Um, but with that being said, today I'm here to request that the CRE contract be added to the agenda for renewal. I'm also here to demand that the history of black, indigenous, and people of color not just be included and tolerated, but celebrated as stated by a certain board trustee in September. As a father and community member, it is important that the curriculum represents the community it serves. Currently about 80% of our students at PVS do have Latino descent, so it's important that we provide a history that has been ignored and misrepresented for far too long. In California, we continue to glamorize the missions and gold rush periods and fail to include the loss of life, enslavement, starvation, illness, and violence inflicted upon California Native Americans during those times. These historical omissions from the curriculum are misleading and can create harmful consequences for black, indigenous, and people of color. In closing, um, I just want to like sit here and take say thank you. like first of all thank you to the young people that came up and spoke eloquently the community and those folks coming up but I think for me it's important that we send a message to the community that we care people show up people take time out of their day step away from their families to come and share their thoughts the community is here asking you all right um, back in the 90s I think it was right um, I was given a little lesson all uh, right not many people cared about me many people threw me away but Mr. Sheckman actually showed me he cared in the 90s and I still remember that to this day so it's important that we do that for the students that we talk about and that we actually do all everything that we state up here so thank you for your thank time you. I appreciate you good evening board my name is Eli I use they them pronouns I'm an ethnic studies major at CSUMB and I live in Aptos my nephew attends Aptos High I am here again to urge you to take action to put the CRE contract renewal on the agenda and vote to renew the contract. I know that this board values a quality, qualified ethnic studies education because the board chose to work with CRE to create a specialized ethnic studies program for Pajaro Valley. This board chose to work with CRE to root the ethnic studies education in the history of this region and its people. I hope this board will recognize that with CRE, they have created a beloved and comprehensive ethnic studies education for Pajaro Valley students. This board has the opportunity to fully integrate this special program into their education and empower students. The analytical tools that are taught in ethnic studies are incredibly important for young people learning to navigate an increasingly complex world. This is the time to encourage structures of liberation. This is the time for bravery. I urge the board to put the CRE contract renewal on the agenda and vote to renew. Thank you. All right, our next three speakers, uh, Pam Sexton, Itzel Barraza, and Dr. Lourdes Barraza. I always have to pull it down. Um, I'm Pam Sexton, I'm a teacher, I'm here as a community member, and I'm here to also um, add to the voices asking you to, to put the CRE contract again on the agenda and to renew it. I, so I, I got my teaching credential in the late 90s in San Francisco, at San Francisco State, 
and I did my student teaching at Mission High School, where I was, um, uh, I, w I taught ethnic studies, one of the first programs. I had an amazing um, mentor teacher, and I learned at that time the history of why ethnic, ethnic studies is so, inc so incredibly important, and that it came out of, of young people walking out of schools because they were not represented in the schools, because their, um, their voices, their history w was not in the schools. Today, the, I'm very familiar with the CRE program because for the last year, because of that experience and also because as an activist with the surge, showing up for racial justice, a county-wide, well, it's a national organization and we have a county chapter, and I've been part of that. Um, joining meetings that UCSC has put on throughout the year about this program, I've spoken to all of, not all, but all of the ethnic studies teachers who've gone to those meetings, which are a lot from PBUSD, and I understand that this program is lifting the voices of our students. It's addressing where they're com coming from. It is not anti-Semitic, and the claims of that are, are a false. Please do this action, show that you care about this. Uh, hello, my name is Ishan, and I am an eighth grader at Rolling Hills. I am here because I was informed that the ethnic studies class that I have been looking forward to is going to be changed by the decisions made by this board in ways that might negatively affect students in my year and beyond. This upsets me because it's constantly my grade that keeps getting cheated out of everything. First, we didn't get to go to our science camp in fifth grade. Second, we didn't have a science teacher for seventh grade. Third, our close-up field trip was almost canceled and then postponed to spring break which means that I can't go home after the four long days of our trip. And now a class that I'm really looking forward to, ethnic studies, is being changed. I just feel that it's unfair that my year is constantly getting important activities taken away or changed in a way that makes them much less special. Some of these things were not as a result of the policies and politics. COVID-19 took science camp away and we may just not have enough people interested in working at PBUSD to fill positions. This ethnic study situation, however, is completely political. You are denying me and my classmates a popular enriching course of classes because some of you didn't do your research. Please add this back to the agenda and reconsider your decision. Thank you. Good evening. I am a parent of two students in the district. My son is currently in the ethnic studies class, and I recently found out that the board made a terrible decision to not renew the contract with CRE back in September. And I just wondered, did any of you research the issue before you voted on it? How about after? Did you research it after? Did any of you reach out to Dr. Allison to question her about the accusations? It did, doesn't sound like anybody did this, and I'm really shocked that you would vote on something that you don't have any information on. Um, I reached out to her and I found her to be very accessible. I could find no evidence that supported the accusations made against her as I researched her, and yet the decision was made not to renew the contract that was based on the opinions of two conservative activists. As I understand it, the members, set the, the members that set the agenda are President Acosta, Vice President Soto, and Trustee Dr. Holmes. I am wondering why the issue regarding the non-renewal contract has not been placed on the agenda, as the community has, surely, has clearly shown interest that it wants it back on the agenda and wants it to be uh, supported. Will you listen to us and put the issue back on the agenda, or will you continue to ignore us? Many of us are concerned about the disruption this decision has caused, including the money that would be wasted if the district should decide uh, to contract with someone else. Assistant Superintendent Mojadas made that clear made it clear that if the district went with another contractor, then we'd have to reinvent the wheel as new teachers and administrators would not be trained. All that work and money that has already been invested would be wasted, as we would have to start over with a new contractor. And President Acosta, you said that you could easily find a bunch of other contractors, but the question is, do, you have, do, do they have the same level of expertise as, do, as Dr. Allison? 
She's a renowned expert in this field, which is why so many ethnic study contractors are associated with her. Clearly, this is an interest, clearly there is an interest in bringing this, this issue back. So as, as people who represent us, I hope that you listen to us and that you make the right decision to bring it back to the agenda and support it. Thank you. All right, our last two speakers, uh, Martha Vega and Marilyn Garrett. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Happy New Year, Trustee. I'd like to congratulate Trustee Acosta and Trustee Soto on your new position. And, uh, and thank you for all the work that you all do, including um, our superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. Um, I'd like to, um, to talk to you guys if you would be willing to consider bringing the CRE contract on the agenda and see things from a different lens um, that might have not been considered. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And I'm speaking today as a resident of Watsonville. Thank you. Your most important obligation is to provide a safe and a healthy learning and working environment and you're not doing it. You've been informed of the dangers of Wi-Fi and the cell towers, and you persist. We want education, not radiation. Also, you talk about research and democracy. Educate before you vaccinate. I've given you these fact sheets, myths and truths about COVID-19, I'll read it again, contagious virus or 5G microwave technology, COVID-19 and the 5G radiation connection, connection. Many epidemiological observations and biological studies indicate the disease called COVID-19 is actually radiation poisoning caused by exposure to microwaves used in 5G wireless technology. Epidemiology, COVID-19 first appeared in Wuhan, China, when they turned on 10,000 5G base stations. It spread to Spain and Italy as these nations deployed 5G technology. Um, COVID then appeared in other European countries, in New York, and major American cities, and smaller cities and rural areas, with 5G now coming from satellites, and less industrialized countries around the world exactly following the rollout of 5G in these locations and the biology, radiation and symptoms, fever, chills, it lists them. I'm gonna, and so this, I'm gonna give the source, westonaprice.org, and they also have one on COVID shots, what we now know, facts, thank you. Okay, we will now move on to item 7.1 through 7.4. These are our employee organization comments. Um, so now is the time that we hear from all of our employee organizations and each organization will have five minutes. And first under 7.1 will be PVFT, our Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening board, congrats on the uh, restructuring of the board. Um, thanks for answering my email, um, Georgia. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, Marie. I want to start off with some good stuff here because um, you know how I get. Uh, so I'm Nelly Baquera Boggs. I'm the president for the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. We represent all of the certificated non administrators. Um, so that is pretty much everybody other than our brothers and sisters in the CSEA who support us um, and this district. Uh, so I want to start off with just um, 
also honoring our counselors. Counselors uh, provide an incredibly, incredibly important service to our students and also the adults in the room. Um, so we are very, very proud to represent the counselors in our district. Um, and the work that they do is important and we don't have enough of them. Um, I also uh, want to mention that um, the PBFT, and I think that the CSEA would feel the same way, we want to be part of this superintendent search. You haven't, this isn't the first time I've asked or mentioned this. We want to be part of this process. We want to um, know who the candidates are. We want to be part of a panel discussion. It's, it's if we're talking about looking for this important person who's going to head our district and and hope cross our fingers that they understand labor or the or a, a respect the people that work in this district um, shutting us out completely is just saying you don't really care about that so we're really hoping that we along with CSEA are invited to um, discussions with the um, candidates because they need to know who we are we are a diverse group of employees in this community, and we're very, very proud of this community. Um, so that's what I want to say about that. Um, okay, now I'm going to get into it. So <laughs> arbitration. We are taking the district to arbitration. What does that mean? That means that there is a disagreement between us and the PBUSD. The PBUSD uh, Human Resources has decided that they want to disrespect our contract. They want to spit on the whole process, due process, of um, our contractual rights. We have had for decades an agreement. We just closed a contract, as a matter of fact, that you all approved in April and in that contract, there was no change in language. It was something that was proposed at the table, and we said no. Yet, it was still put into place this year. People lost pay. We worked so hard to make some significant wins so that our students, because they're the ones that benefit when there are people who are credentialed in their classroom. We made significant gains to get positions filled. Yet, our emplo the employees are still disrespected. Our contract is disrespected. So at this time, at this time, when the district talks about having to be careful about where they spend their funds that they receive to educate our community of students, at this time, when they're in negotiations with CSEA and they're dragging their feet on negotiating a living wage with the CSEA because, again, the argument of funding, they're willing to choose to spend thousands of dollars to go to arbitration as opposed to, no, to acknowledge that what they're committing is an unfair labor practice, that it is not right, they're in the wrong. And we will fight this because we know that this right, which is also, so in California law, education law, we get 10 days in our contract. 10 of those days can be personal necessity. So the district's in the wrong. I really hope that you trustees have a discussion about where money's going and how it's being spent and the type of reputation that we're trying to work with the district to heal from, to get rid of. This is a great place to work. We need great administrators. And this is why we want to be part of that panel. So, um, you know, we're, we're proud of our bargaining rights and we're proud to partner with the district. We're bringing 40,000 books to this community, February 24th, mark your calendars. The PBFT is bringing 40,000 books to this community. We're proud to work with Mr. Sheckman. He was willing to offer up a site. We're gonna distribute. And we're also, thank you to Mr. Sheckman as well for having worked with me to um, help in sending two of our CTE teachers to one of our American Federation of Teachers um, conferences on, C on career and technical education. So thank you for that as well. Thanks. 
Thank you. Uh, 7.2, CSEA, California School Employees Association. Do we have anyone here from CSEA? Okay, moving on. 7.3, Pavam, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Ready? Good afternoon, President Acosta, Superintendent Sheckman, Cabinet, members of the board. My name is Luis Medina. I'm the Director of Migrant Education. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to give a short presentation about Migrant Education. And I'll start with the, uh, the after school program. Uh, for our migrant after school program, we offer classes in most of our uh, school sites in collaboration with the Hispanic Learning Program. Most of our curriculum is, uh, is using, uh, using hands on activities. Uh, we integrate math and science in most of our classes. The, uh, we are um, trying to expand our program, um, but we're having a difficult time finding qualified personnel that are willing to work after school. Uh, for those students that can't stay after school, uh, we do offer um, virtual academy. Um, we offer about uh, about 100 students actually stay after, uh, actually they connect uh, virtually uh, for our classes, and this ones are for K through eight. Uh, we do have bilingual classes, the uh, bilingual teachers, and during this time, actually parents have an opportunity to actually connect with the uh, staff and ask questions regardless of the uh, topic. Uh, moving on, the uh, those are some of the uh, pictures of the, um, classes that we offer some of the students. Um, also this year, the, uh, we, um, we're planning, uh, actually we plan four field trips the, uh, for, the, for the entire school year. The, uh, we actually uh, we, uh, recruit 200 students, uh, fifth through eighth grade, uh, fifth through eighth grade. The, uh, the uh, four sites that we uh, actually um, decided on are the, uh, um, what are the uh, sites? The, um, the uh, Maker's Fair in San Francisco, the Young Museum in San Francisco, the uh, San Francisco uh, Exploratory in San Jose Tech Museum. We already took a couple of field trips here, and you can see a couple of pictures that yeah, we have. The students had a great time, and they're very grateful about the opportunity to be able to take these uh, field trips. Moving on, since I have a lot of information, the uh, for speech and debate, we're hoping to have a student's representation from all uh, six middle schools. Uh, we currently have eight staff members working at the, at the different sites preparing students for the uh, competition. Uh, for middle school, we hope to have a Spanish and English debate team and be represented in Spanish and English speech for every single grade level. Uh, for high school, to have a debate uh, team for both Spanish and English and the same team for Spanish in all four grade levels for speech. The, um, in the past, uh, last Monday, we, we actually took 25 students to Salinas to be uh, trained in how to do the uh, speech. And this coming Friday, we're going to take an additional 25 students to be trained on the uh, debate. Um, the original competition will be on March 9. It's going to be in Salinas, and we're hoping to take 50 students. The state competition will be on May 3rd through the 5th in Monterey, and we're going to be taking, the goal is 34 students. The, uh, I, I do want to say special thanks to um, Lisa for the uh, cooperation and support of our program, and to Jim Bruno because the, uh, she's, uh, her program is paying for most of the uh, competition, the uh, cost of the competition. Moving on, the, uh, so that's the uh, debate team. Last year we actually were able to bring about 15 trophies to PBUSD. We actually did a great job with that. And moving on for the our pre-K program, the uh, we opened a site uh, in one of our sites, and we actually had 16 students participating. But because of the um, the teacher actually um, left the uh, program, we're looking for one. So right now we're on hold on the uh, site, the uh, pre-K program. We also offer a um, those are some of the uh, pictures, the uh, a home-based program. Uh, we schedule meetings with our families. The staff uh, provides the uh, materials and the uh, training to the parents, and the uh, parents do most of the work and the teaching to the students. And if any parent has a question, we always have somebody available that can answer their questions uh, at any time during the day. Oops, sorry. 
For secondary education, the, uh, we have three excellent uh, staff members at the high school level. They do provide academic guidance, uh, transcript analysis, parent meetings, such as financial aid and A through G requirements, credit recovery for, and we use cyber high ingenuity. We have the Immigrant uh, Student Association Club. We do have the uh, field trips to colleges and the universities, and we do provide the uh, services to, uh, through the uh, camp program, uh, most of the uh, state colleges. And yeah, we have some pictures of some of the activities that high school students do, field trips. And moving on to parent ed. And I'm going fast. The, uh, we do have a, a parent meeting every month, the first Tuesday of the month. It's from seven to nine. The, uh, we do have, have some topics. Parents do select the topics, and some of the topics that we already cover are school safety, drug use prevention uh, at the school level, nutrition, mental health, and math nights. The also something new that is happening this year, sorry, I have a couple more minutes. The uh, my, is Mañana de Te is uh, Sabiduría. So it's a monthly meeting. Uh, it happens uh, on the first Thursday of the month. It's from 11 to 12. Sorry. And the, uh, well, and the presentation is online, so if anybody wants to see All it. Right. Yeah. Thank you for your time, Luis. <laughs> Thanks. I timed it before. But yeah. Sorry, but thank you. Thank you. And we We'll have that shared with us so we could see the rest of the presentation. Uh, moving to 7.4, CWA Communication Workers of America. These are the representatives of our substitute teachers. Is anyone here from CWA? Okay, seeing none. Um, I do have a um, special request that came into the board. It was brought to the board's attention. Can I see this right quick? That um, one of... Um, I know the agenda was already approved, but it's been brought to our attention that for item 9.2, 9 which is a report and discussion item, that our representative that's here has young children here with her this evening. So I would like to ask the board if we could um, amend this, our approval of the agenda, to move 9.2 to now before we start with our action items. Can I I'd have like a motion? To, I'd like to make a motion to approve that, Second. the change. Okay, I have, so just so we all understand, it's a motion to amend the agenda, uh, approval of the agenda to move 9.2 to before the action items. I have a first and a second. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that carries a 7-0. So, let me jump my note, sorry. My 9.2. So we will now jump to 9.2. This is a report and discussion item um, for PBUSD Food and Nutrition Services Local Partnerships featuring Esperanza Community Farms. This report will be presented by Jean Atkin, the Director of Food and Nutrition Services, Alma Leonora Sanchez, and Mayra Gomez Contreras of Esperanza Community Farms. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. This is exciting to uh, be moved up a bit. Um, good evening, Board of Trustees. Well, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Uh, good evening, Board of Trustees and Interim Superintendent Murray Sheckman. So happy to be here tonight talking about um, kind of an exciting topic. Thanks to Adam Scow for uh, suggesting the topic. Um, so for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about the local partnerships Food and Nutrition Services has um, with the community. Um, and we're going to, in particular, feature Esperanza Farms. We have a very unique partnership with them, and they're going to talk a little bit more about that, but it's pretty exciting. Okay, so let me get my clicker. Multitasking here. Uh, just as an introduction, um, we, we do have a partnership with a lot of local um, companies, particularly farmers, and we have a lot of incentive uh, within this past year, especially to partner with local businesses, local farms, uh, particularly um, in addition to that, uh, companies that uh, have products that are unprocessed or minimally processed. Getting a lot of push for that. 
Um, some of the particular funding that we have received this year is a little over $6,000, again, for local purchases of unprocessed or minimally processed food. Um, we're really, really hoping that that funding continues, but at this point we don't know. So crossing our fingers that we can maintain these partnerships. In addition to that, I think it's important for you to realize that every year we get entitlement dollars, um, USDA commodity dollars. We typically get about $800,000 a year, and um, that number is based on the number of meals that we serve the prior year, and that's how we get funding, and we spend the, the lion's share of that on produce. And as of last fall, we are seeing a lot more organic offerings through USDA commodities, which is really, really nice. Also important to know that we do partner with a lot of nonprofit organizations. They write um, a lot of grants and get funding to help promote the idea of um, more sustainability, purchasing from um, more conscientious vendors um, and businesses. And these are just some of the some of the partnerships we have. Okay, so just to gonna briefly talk about some of the benefits of working with local farmers. Um, obviously, it's great to keep the money local. It it's, creates a great sense of pride uh, for the community. It's, um, it's also ultra fresh. A lot of times when we get our products from harvest of the, for harvest of the month, those items were picked that day or the day before versus weeks or months prior. And obviously, seasonality becomes more real to students um, through Harvest of the Month, through Life Lab, through field trips, through our salad bars. They, they really learn, hopefully, more seasonality. Some of the challenges, obviously, cost. Um, as you all know, organic costs a lot more than conventional, um, and we're no exception. And then basically supply and demand and also infrastructure and deliveries are a challenge. A lot of times the smaller farmers aren't able to deliver to all of our sites. So it, it just, it, it creates more work and takes up more space in our central warehouse. And then uh, also consistency and appreciation. Quality isn't always consistent and you can't, you can't control nature. So we may contract to get strawberries in March, but they might not be ready until, you know, June. Um, or we may, anyway, you get it. <laughs> okay, quick map. Um, the blue dot is this building, uh, the district office, and then um, all the other little green dots are, this is just kind of like a hyper-local map. We actually go all the way up north of San Francisco and farther south and all over California, but this is just kind of a little snapshot of, of the local businesses that we work with, mostly farms. Okay, let's get into the companies. Um, we work with Watsonville Coast Produce. They're a, they're a pretty large distributor, kind of um, one of the bigger ones in California. And other than DOD and our commodities, we purchase um, a lot of produce from Coast Produce. One of the biggest advantages of working with Coast is they deliver to every single site, um, sometimes twice a week, uh, and that's, that's a real advantage to our program. Then we have JSM Organics, um, Javier Zamora. Um, the farm is located very close to Hall District Elementary. We get wonderful, wonderful strawberries from him every year. If you've never had a chance to try them, just stop by any one of our schools in the month of May and give them a try. And Javier is wonderful. He's always agreeing to come and do tastings with us. Um, anytime we have an event, he's there. He's willing to promote organic farming and farming. He has a real passion for it. And then we have LDNY Organics. This is a new partner as of this fall. Um, this is Guillermo Lazaro's farm. We actually met him through Esperanza. He, he helps at Esperanza a lot. Um, and we were able to partner with him and we'll be partnering with him next year. We've already agreed to partner with him for his cherry tomatoes and snap peas. Then we have Hikari Farms. Um, Janet Nagamine, she is the current owner. Um, of the farm. She's also a local physician, so it's really fun. You can see um, she has her doctor's coat on, 
Um, so when, we, when she does tastings, it's really fun to see the kids' expression when you tell them, oh, she's a farmer and a doctor. And they're just like, wow. Um, so it's really exciting. And then that picture in the lower left um, corner is her with her lead um, operations manager, his daughter and his granddaughter, all at Calabasas where Janet went to elementary school. So that's really good. And if you've never tasted her cucumbers, they are so good. Um, she actually has a contract with Chez Panisse up in Berkeley with Alice Waters and sells her cucumbers to them too. But we get them here in August and September. Uh -oh. uh, and then we have Murakami, Murakami Farms. They're also um, right off Buena Vista in Watsonville. Road, oh, in Watsonville. Sorry. Um, and they have great kiwis. If you ever have a chance to taste them, they sell them at the farmer's market. Lakeside Organics. Um, this is the largest family-owned organic um, vegetable grower and shipper in the U.S. And we get the pleasure of working with them. There's a beautiful field of leeks right across the street over here. And they grow all over the area. So that's, that's really nice. And we're featuring um, their cabbage this month. A couple more and then we get to us, Bronza Farms. Um, then we have the Fruit Guys. This is kind of a unique partnership because we partner with them for our FFVP program, which is our fresh fruit and vegetable program. Um, we, that's, that's through a yearly grant that we apply for. Um, and we serve at 12, 12 elementaries every day at recess. Um, we get all kinds of fun and unique fruits and vegetables from them. Some really funky things like rambutan and dragon fruit, um, along with a lot of regular stuff that we grow here in America. But it's a nice opportunity for the kids to learn about fruits and vegetables. And then we come to Esperanza Farms. Um, this is a really unique partnership because not only do we buy produce from them for our schools, but they have really been the, a trailblazer um, in bringing farm to cafeteria, especially to PV High. Um, and I'm going to let them talk about what they've done and how they did it. But it is a really, really unique program, and I think it's a, it's a great example for other districts. So. Thank you, Jeannie. Hello board, um, my name is Alma. I am the Farm to Cafeteria Project Manager for Esperanza Community Farms. Um, I'm here with Mireya. Thank you so much for moving this up on the agenda. My nine-year-old and five-year-old really appreciate it. <laughs> and I will in the morning. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Esperanza Community Farms, pro um, what we've done with the district and PV High specifically. Um, we started the Farm to Cafeteria project in 2021 um, with student visits to the farm. Um, we started serving salads at PV High campus in summer 2022. Um, and so from since 2022, we've uh, developed different ways for students to get involved with a community farm, a local organic community farm um, like ours. Um, some, some ways for students to get involved are um, teachers are bringing students out to the farm in field trips. We've had students visit the farm from all over California, which is super awesome. Um, and students from this school district also visiting the farm. Um, this gives them an opportunity to learn about local organic and regenerative community farming, how we're doing it, and also how other local farmers of color are also doing it um, in the Pajaro and Salinas Valley. Um, we also have in-depth conversations with them on the farm about what an equitable food chain is, um, how that looks like in Watsonville, how it's attainable in Watsonville, um, and what their roles as students and as community members can look like in this equitable food chain, um, and then how they can create an equitable food chain um, at their schools or um, in their community. Um, they also have the opportunity to harvest and take home vegetables, um, which is a super amazing thing to see, like a bunch of students with their backpacks on, like walking through the fields and like with a giant calabaza, like just walking around, which is super awesome. Um, another way for students to get involved is through our internship. At the moment, we have one Farm to Cafeteria Youth Leaders Internship. It runs from May through July. 
Um, this internship actively engages students in leadership opportunities to learn and implement an equitable food chain. Um, we work with students to obtain their food handler certificate. Um, they get to harvest and learn how to prep and serve um, salads during summer school to high school students. Um, they can develop different types of student engagement activities on how to um, engage their peers in the community farm and what the salad is, how it's unique and um, special to Watsonville and to this community. Um, there are also opportunities within this internship for students to present what they have learned about community farming um, through uh, presenting to city council members or school board members um, and being a part of that conversation to make policy changes towards getting more um, healthy, organic, and local produce on their campuses. Um, we also have salads being served during the regular school year. Um, our season last year ran from August to November, but we are looking to expand that. Um, the students are also engaged in prepping the salads during the school year. Um, it's not part of an internship, but they still get the opportunity to learn about um, food prep, um, how to engage students with healthy alternatives. Um, they learn about what it's like um, to prepare food in a cafeteria. So a lot of students get to learn about um, what cafeteria staff are doing, um, where their food is coming from, which is super important. Um, and then we also try to host at least one um, on-campus student engagement event per, per season. Um, in 2023, we hosted the first Farm to School Rally at Pajaro Valley High School. Um, we invite um, city council members, school board members, um, teachers, all students at PV High um, to celebrate um, what we've done with Farm to Cafeteria in that season, celebrate the hard work that goes into organic farming, um, appreciate organic farmers and the work that cafeteria staff have done, um, and ultimately just increase awareness, um, student awareness on just food justice and, um, and how it's happening at their campus. Um, in 2023, we served twice as many salads as we did in 2022. Um, in total, we served over 2,500 salads at all campuses um, where salads were served. Um, we increased the salads we served at Pajaro Valley High School, and we also expanded, to, um, expanded the salads to three additional schools, which include Renaissance High, Diamond Technology Institute, and New School Community Day High School. Um, and we hope to continue to do that. Um, this season as well. Um, some challenges that we've faced are, um, like I mentioned, student awareness. We want to work, continue to work towards um, students knowing about Farm to Cafeteria, knowing about where their food comes from, um, and being able to participate in these types of programs um, that kind of um, show them about what's happening in their community. Um, also, uh, even though there's limited space in the PV High Kitchen, um, the cafeteria staff have been super supportive and um, are excited to see students choosing healthier alternatives. Um, and also just like um, a shift in um, student choices in what they eat. Um, we are excited to offer and expand more um, with the Farm to Cafeteria program um, at a pace that allows for it Sorry, considering um, like funding and staffing. Um, do you want to mention something? I just have two quick points. Um, I've been with the organization since 2017 as the co-leader, along with our farmer, Guillermo Lazaro. And I started out as a CSA member. Um, my life has been transformed, and I see how students' lives are being transformed. Um, the project costs just over $100,000 to operate. We are not about qu quantity, we're about quality, and so we really go as deep as we can in terms of um, demonstrating the interdependence that exists around us. Uh, and in a community like this that's so agriculture heavy, there's so much uh, potential for 
uplifting the pride um, in multi-generational families and to direct students to the many, many agricultural jobs that exist beyond farm, farm labor. Um, the one, the final thing I'll say is that we are a nonprofit, and we we're hoping that the nonprofit serves as a, as a tool to demonstrate to the school district, not only this one, but others in the region, that this kind of program can become an integrated program within the the school system and academic um, system. So that's kind of the next set of years for us is we want to we want to integrate it into the classroom um, have the farm itself be a, a learning space an experiential learning space and so um, we we'd love to have some funding come from the district um, right now we pull from national foundation money and state money and uh, the last thing is I we have some stickers for you that may I share them with with all of you that's appropriate. <laughs> uh, this was designed by one of the student interns. Um, and I can't say it, how proud, uh, in particular, I am as a mama. Uh, the student-led piece here is pretty incredible. Uh, we really have just gotten out of the way of students that have decided what they, what they want in their salad and how often. And, um, it's been such an, a pleasure working with Jeannie and her team. They really have um, really welcomed us in. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? Uh, no, we do not. OK. And I will bring it back to the board. Any discussion from the board? Trustee Flores. I just want to say I was I did attend that rally and it was amazing and I encouraged you know all of our campuses to get more involved like this and it was it was great to see the students choosing these fresh alternatives you know and not you know some of the stuff we do t tend to see our teenagers eat they were excited to have these salads and I I heard all about the dressing I wasn't able to taste it but I will eventually um, but yeah, no, I think it's a great um, program that we have, and I hope to see it implemented in more of our classrooms. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Bolano Scal. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. Mireya Alma for this great presentation. Super excited. Uh, super exciting. Makes me happy. I've been waiting for this presentation. Thank you to Agenda Setting and Mr. Sheckman for making this happen uh, tonight. Uh, so many benefits. Healthy food for our kids. We're keeping our money local in the community, supporting local businesses, local nonprofits, as you've listed. Really tr tremendous people invested in our community, employing people. Organic healthy food, less toxic pesticides being sprayed around our schools, which is a problem at some of our schools. Um, better for the soil, growing a healthy assortment of vegetables because our soil, are, are we need variety in our uh, in our microbiome. And we're also setting an example for a local business internship. You know, this is we talk about CTE classes. Not everybody's going to be a techie at Google. Talk about pro producing healthy food for our community and actually building a sustainable business. So this also, I think we can build on this. This is a, maybe a CTE uh, opportunity where there's a lot of interest in having sustainable ag, possibly be a CTE class at PV High. Um, what a great idea. Um, and so, I hope we can expand on this, build on this. I know we got a lot of schools, and I know I understand the scale is, is always an issue. We have to have reliability. How can we? That's a great challenge, and I'm sure it's always something you're thinking about, Jeannie. I appreciate that reality. But I just want to say uh, the more we can build on this, the better. Um, so thank you so much for everybody's work. Thank you, Trustee Blasco. Trustee Dr. Hom. I just wanted to say thank you for your work with this. You know, as you know, with the background with, with public health nursing and just looking at you know, the long-term health outcomes for, you know, our student and our communities. It's, it's so important to have this connection to healthy food as something that's enjoyable and interesting and exciting and, and you're creating that. And, you know, so this is really creating, and for some of the reasons that, you know, my colleague <laughs> mentioned, but there's just those connections for long-term personal and community health. Thank you for the work that you're doing. 
Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Hall. So I've been on the board for 14 years, and um, I've been a champion of programs like this um, since I entered my trustee seat. Um, we started out with Life Lab at many of the schools, so we tried to have farm to garden to cafeteria, and when I first started, we were told we couldn't use the organically grown produce in our own school gardens in the cafeteria because of liability issues. So we've come a long way, and so I want to thank you for the work. This is a beautiful farm, and um, I think all of us up here support you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dodge, Jr. I'd just like to say thank you, Janie, for doing your work. Uh, I was a little late, but I was able to get a salad at PV. So um, the students like it. Hopefully, I think you know we could bring something like that more to Watson High School too, as well, because you know not everybody likes school lunches, and I, I know you know my daughter in particular, they they want a different option. You know, they, they want something healthy. You know, I really didn't understand a lot about organic fruits and vegetables. I know Trustee Scal that he had to enlighten me on some of those things. Um, because it's a process, you know. I had an idea of the pesticides being used around our schools, but, you know, Trustee Skiles showed us we don't always need to use pesticides. Uh, he showed me that Lakeside, Lakeside Organics does a, a lot of great work, and hopefully um, we could continue to use them a lot more. You know, I know they provide a lot of vegetables, or you know, they have organic options. And also to Lakeside Organic, you know, they employ local residents, but they also put them in positions of leadership. And so I, I'd like to mention that as well. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you for your presentation. Um, agriculture is very important in our community. Um, it's not just work in the fields, but it's also being in position to lead and take care of these fields. Um, you know, I, I know water is an important issue too. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring that up and say thank you guys. Thank you, Mireya. I, 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 I know your love and support for our community of Watsonville. Um, and so I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Vice President Soto. Yeah, I want to thank you guys for your work as well. Um, this is very, it's a good thing. You know, I'm, I'm a farm kid myself. I grew up on a ranch in Salinas. Uh, we grew vegetables and worked cattle, you know, and uh, I spent a lot of time with my dad out in the field, and I learned a lot growing up back then. I didn't, I, back then I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now, because now I'm able to apply a lot of the principles that I learned growing up on the farm with my own private garden, and we you know we have a lot of surplus, and we share it with the family, and it doesn't always come out, you know, as pretty as it does in the store, but it sure tastes really good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, this is good that you know we're teaching the kids some tangible skills because those types of things are going away. You know, if you learn a trade, if you can wrench on a car, or build a house, or you know plant a flower and let it grow and uh, nurture it, you know those are, those are skills that people can't take away from you that you you've you know you learn on yourself and you're able to take it with you wherever you go. So thank you. Thank you, Vice President. So our student trustee. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that this is amazing work that you all are doing and I would really like to see our district continue supporting um, work like this, uh, especially being in an area where it's agriculture rich, yet there hasn't historically been much access to nutritious foods and meals and this is a crucial step in um, increasing the accessibility for our students in the district and to continue supporting that, that's very important. Uh, thank you. Thank you, student trustee Mejia. So, um, what? And then there was one. Um, <laughs> so, anything I say is just really going to be echoing everything pretty much you've heard from all of my colleagues and our, our wonderful student trustee. And um, I would just really echo the thank you. Thank you to you and Esperanza Farms. And I'm glad that my colleagues ag agreed to support moving this up. So, um, we, sorry, we didn't notice sooner. Um, but again, thank you. And, and there's, it's also one of the things I like is it's helping breaking down some barriers and misconceptions with the ag industry, which we are 
so heavily reliant on in this region, and we constantly say, right, the Salinas and Pajaro Ag Valleys are literally feeding the world. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. And thank you for being a part of helping break down some of those misunderstandings and misconceptions and those barriers. And of course, for all your work you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's a whole team, not just me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, get reordered here. So now we will be moving back to our action items. Um, we will be starting with 8.1, resolution number 23-24-21 for the Watsonville Community Hospital bond measure. And this report will be presented by our Superintendent Sheckman. But we also have Tony Nunez. We also have Tony Nunez who's on the board. Um, for the hospital and this Joe Gallagher. Joe Gallagher. Oh, I know Joe. Okay. Um, we've had good discussion as a board. You've had good discussion as a board. Um, the CFO and Tony presented about six weeks ago, and there was really live, not lively, but good questions and answers. And some people have asked me, why would the board, why would a public school K-12 T, uh, TK board support a local hospital? And my answer has always been because the medical services have a direct correlation to our kids' academic success. S um, and so uh, I am here tonight to help this, our colleagues in the hospital. They've done a magnificent job, first of creating the region, identifying the need, raising a, some money, getting help from the state, but they've discovered some issues with their property and some debt and they, um, it, this bond is very, very important, and so they're here to answer any questions, but the intent tonight is to ask our governing board to support Measure M. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Sheckman. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? Uh, no, we do not. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dr. Holm. Um, I you know, I, I would like to make a motion to support this. Um, I, it's it's been a long time coming to make this hospital a public entity, and it's a, a major victory. And I mentioned, you know, last time we discussed this, it's you know, you know, Mr. Sheckman, you spoke about you know how connected the hospital is to this community, and it's like, yeah, I, I I've seen many of our students born in that hospital. You know, it's like I, I've been there. Um, Dr. Gallagher, I know you've taken care of many of the families, you know, that have come through our, 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 our schools and the community, and, and it's, um, we're connected, so. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. And Trustee DeSerpa, she had her hand up first. Thank you. I'll be supporting this resolution tonight. I thank you for coming and for waiting this long to hear this item. I'm so sorry. Tony, you should have brought your one-year-old. We might have been able to move it up. That's the cheat code I know for the next time. Right. Yeah. 
anyway, um, I know you both. Um, I, I'm a former employee. I was a per diem social worker. And um, I care deeply uh, for the hospital and for the work that's done there. And to all the employees who have stuck it out and who are continuing to work there um, with respect and care for the patient population, um, thank you. Thank you for bringing this forward. I can't wait until you buy the hospital grounds back. They should have never been sold. It was a very sad day um, when that happened. So thanks for bringing this resolution. Trustee DeSerpa, will that be a second? Because I already have a motion. Yes, thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Bolano Scow. I'll keep it brief because I s second everything uh, Trustee Holm and Trustee DeSerpa said. Um, got my public endorsement, my private endorsement. Is there a way that people can get involved? And this is so important uh, because we were losing money as a community, as Trustee DeSerpa said. This is our public hospital. Thank you for your leadership and bringing this forward. Voter turnout, not projected to be amazing. So if you're out there in the public watching and listening, we need people to vote in this election, in this primary election. Uh, I have many friends who are uh, affiliated with the hospital, doctors who work for the hospital, nurses. We need to get out the vote. We need everybody, all ages, uh, to be voting yes for this. So if you want to share anything about ways people can get more, more involved and learn more about this campaign. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that question. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here in front of all of you tonight. So uh, this Saturday, we're actually just starting our door-to-door uh, -door knocking campaign. And so um, we'll be gathering at 9.30 a.m. over at La Manzana in downtown Watsonville, 519 Main Street. Um, and at 9.30, we'll be doing some informational um, uh, 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 workshops with a few of the volunteers that we have there. And then at uh, 10 a.m. sharp, we'll be going door-to-door letting the people know um, throughout the, the district, which um, uh, very closely mirrors your district as well too, just with a little bit of the northern tip of Aptos cut off, um, that, the, um, that the March uh, 5th uh, primary election is very important for our, not only the Pajar Valley Healthcare District and Watsonville Community Hospital, but for our community and for the healthcare landscape across Santa Cruz County and the Central Coast. Um, you can also find additional information at uh, yesonmeasurend.net. That's yesonmeasurend.net. There you can go, you can fill out an endorsement form, you can make a donation, or you can say, hey, I want some more information and we'd be happy to give back with any other information that you need about this or any questions that you have. So thank you. I thought of another connection other than just the general academic achievement, which is the health academies. At, at, and I have had the opportunity to speak briefly at Watsonville High and PV High. Um, I don't know the status of whether there is one at Aptos, but it's been an interesting opportunity to talk to high school juniors and seniors with the idea to encourage people into uh, healthcare careers and uh, it's sort of fun to be around young people. Thank you both. Thank you, Trustee Blasco. Any other members of the board? Comments, discussions? Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you for being here this evening. I, I obviously support, you know, passing this this bond, this measure. And I would just like to say, you know, to make to the, the people that I represent, you know, which is directly the city of Watsonville, make sure you go out and support this measure. You know, support the local jobs. You know that our, you know, our neighbors work at, uh, where our kids could possibly work at, where our kids were born. This is this is very important, you know. We we can't rely on oh well, it's not that important. This voting this time around, or it'll pass. Um, Watson Community Hospital, for some of us, it's all that we have. You know, not all of us are are blessed to have insurance through our jobs, our you know through our spouses, and sometimes, you know, people wait to the very last second, you know before they go to the hospital and the hospital's in and we can't afford to lose that hospital. So i just like to implore the people of Watsonville to please support this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Anyone else? Okay, see none. I uh, want to thank you both for being here this evening and your understanding and patience to wait. Sorry about that. Yeah, the one-year-old, one -year -old you, would have, you would have had it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a first and a second. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Congratulations. Thank you Best so much. Luck. Thank you, folks. And now moving on to item 8.2, our MOU with the unions, the incentive plan to attract school bus drivers. This report will be presented by our superintendent, Sheckman. Thank you, President Acosta. This is an issue that uh, basically our team over here and I get phone calls every day. And, uh, I'm grateful. Oh, they can hear me. <laughs> I'm grateful that Mark is here in case there are any questions, but this is a very simple proposal. This was negotiated with our two unions because the money is from our district and they have that right. So what the MOU is proposing is that if an employee recruits somebody who becomes a bus driver and they stay as a bus driver for two years, that employee will get $1,000. That's what this is about. So it's simply a way to try and incentivize, that was pronounced correctly, um, finances to get more bus drivers, which as Mark knows, we need every day. That's it. Thank you, Superintendent Sheckman. Do we have any uh, public speakers to this item? Uh, no, we do not. Okay. Seeing then, I will bring this back to the board for discussion. Uh, tr sorry, Trustee Dr. Holm. I support, I move to approve. I second. Okay. I have a first and second. Is there any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa. Does this include board members? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. No. I, we recruit a lot of people into the Absolutely. district because we know how awesome the benefits are for people. You bet. So uh, that's all. I was just making a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Don't joke. Give us a bus driver. So can I ask Trusty a question? Blocks. Somebody asked me, they said they had a DUI 10 years ago, but they've been clean since then. What's the deal? I, I don't know the law. Mark, would you, would you clarify if somebody had a DUO, DUI, but it was 10 yeah, years ago? More than okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh, I'm way to throw it back down. So. <laughs> well, we can do some Sounds like a maybe. All right. For now, I'm hopeful you'll support the motion. It's a simple motion. We need bus drivers. We're making some progress, but not enough. I did have a question on the resolution. I'm sorry. It was. Um, could you bring it back up real quick? Just had a question. They're okay. both the same. One is CSEA. One is. Uh, yeah. Oh, either one. Can you well, definitely enlarge it? So uh, no, the. Mm -hmm. So if this is only for someone who actually holds all the certifications and licensing to be a school bus driver? It wouldn't be for someone that goes through our training program? No, no. They walk in the front door without any training. It takes a while to get trained, but if they go through the training and um, after whatever period of time we say there, that $1,000 goes to the employee. Whoops, whoops. Okay. Wait. I'm, Allison, I'm, I'm, would you clarify? I'm, 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 yeah, that's not what it says, right? But can can we have that included in there? Or please, Allison, I'm sorry. It does. Say that's it. not way I'm reading that, right? So the way I'm reading this, that they must walk through the door with all the licensing to be a school bus driver. Which, by the way, that's a lot of licensing that they have to go through. But it, it this doesn't seem inclusive of if somebody brought forward a candidate that went through our training program and then then became a licensed bus driver correct the incentive is for someone who comes to the district that we can put on the street like right away not bringing someone in for into the training program if that is the wish of the board i think we could maybe look at a different one so that we could move forward with this one if we wanted to make a separate one that maybe looks a little bit different with a different structure because it's obviously a totally different process right of making sure they're going through that whole thing um, you know, obviously we can talk with our labor unions regarding that um, if you want to expand it. But I think, so I don't think you can, if you were to add it to this and we would have to take it all back. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm saying we could always do a separate one if that's what you guys want right. us to look into or want to give direction to the superintendent to look into. Sure. I, and I don't want to complicate this, but I, that was something that caught me. And I think, okay. so I'm, I, I am fully supportive of this as is so it can move forward. But I'd like to, if hopefully um, the rest of the board maybe would be 
interested in supporting that can maybe direct the superintendent and his staff to um, see if the unions would maybe support that in an, in a future <coughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I was just rereading it real quick just so I think you're suggesting we mirror mirror what we do here but also if it, they so in as a trend. just what? to expand on if you're okay with that trustee Acosta is um, we did that with the signing bonus right we first started with yeah. just getting licensed drivers <laughs> and then we wanted we weren't getting it and then we wanted to expand it and the, the latest one was expanded to a different you know a different amount for if they came in without that training and they got a different kind of signing bonus so but no I mean for our employees I, I know so right. I'm saying to oh. use that same example of then we can make something separate we've, we've gone through a couple different iterations is my point yeah. of trying to do the signing bonus this is very similar I know it's a finders fee bonus if you will yeah. so we could maybe look at a different kind of structure for that type of employee coming in because the requirements coming in are different right okay thank yeah, you it's just course. something when yep. I read the no, language good question. Of it, I thought thank you Okay, so we have a first and a second. So unless there's any further, oh, sorry. Tracy I, I just want to say, you know, I'm definitely in support of this and any other ideas we can think of because the thought of any of our students being left at a bus stop without a bus driver is just unthinkable. So we have, I think, 21 vacancies. So yeah, let's get a lot, a lot more creative and figure out ways to get some more bus drivers on our streets. Thank you. Any other comments from any other board members? Thank you, Trustee Flores. Okay, see none. So we have a first and a second, so I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion, the vote carries 7-0. Okay. <clears throat> and now moving on to item 8.3, Counselor's Week of February 5th through February 9th, 2024. This report will be presented by our Superintendent Sheckman as well. Three in a row. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm really grateful, Nellie, I'm not sure if she's still here, but she recognized our counselors, all counselors in her presentation. I spent the last eight years of my career teaching in the Counseling Ed program at San Jose State. I'm delighted to come back and see the work that we're doing here with our counseling staff, and it is time to recognize them I want to bring real quickly some research that I uh, used to use. University of Florida researchers have shown that when counselors are in leadership positions in schools, the school culture is more inviting for kids, and that's because counselors have very unique training, very unique skills. And we love our counselors and we appreciate it. We hope they're watching, or maybe they're watching a, a fun movie. That would be more appropriate to celebrate Counselors Week. But thanks, counselors, for what you do. And thank you, staff, for supporting the work that our counselors do. Really appreciate it. That's it. Good. Uh, any public comments? Oh, we have no speakers to this. Okay. We will then, I will bring it back to the board. Any comments or discussion from the board? Trustee Bolano Scow. Uh, thank you for bringing this. Um, we got a lot of great counselors. We have a lot of challenges with discipline in some of our schools right now. Um, so I just want to hope that we can that uh, embrace them, listen to them, get some creative ideas for how we can bolster their resources, bolster their their efficacy. I know Superintendent Sheckman, is, you got this in your background. This is in your wheelhouse. I know this is something you're paying attention to. So let's let's do everything we can uh, to empower our counselors, keep them at PVUSD, and address the problems. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Belanosco. Trustee Dodge Jr. I would just like to say thank you to all the counselors. I, some of us here are products of Watsonville High School and PVUSD. I just also like to thank and recognize my counselor, who's still at Watsonville High, who's now my daughter's counselor. And so that shows the dedication of our counselors that want to be here, who want to stay, and want to help our children. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Trustee Jones Jr. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, probably about halfway through our tenure, or my tenure here at the district, um, we had enough money to add extra social emotional counselors because we knew the need was great on behalf of our children. Our stakeholders told us, like, please help. Um, and so, 
we've recruited a lot of really wonderful um, counselors into our district, and I want to thank them personally as a mental health professional for the work that they do every day here. And um, with that, we need a motion, correct? I'd like to make a motion to approve this resolution in support of our school counselors. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa and Trustee Bolanoscal for the second, and our student trustee would like to speak. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, I also would like to thank our school counselors who, of course, do um, work for our students every day. Um, but I would also like to specifically acknowledge like support programs in our schools as well, like um, Gear Up and EAOP that are also always available to students with their questions, especially um, as a first generation student, their support. And with my school counselors, I mean, their support has been very very much appreciated and that's also like the reasons a lot of students are on track and are interested in pursuing um, college and are also exploring alternatives like pathways and other options outside of high school thank you thank you student trustee mahan anyone else okay we have a first and a second i'll call for a vote all those in favor aye any opposed no, the vote carries seven zero. Thank you. And thank you, Superintendent Sheckman, for your report. Um, <clears throat> moving to item 8.4, resolution number 23-24-22, acknowledging Black History Month. And this report will be prese presented by our own Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education, Claudia Monjeres. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. So good evening, Board President Acosta, uh, trustees, and Mr. Sheckman. So my name is Claudia Mojaraz. I'm the Assistant Soup for Elementary Education. And tonight, I'm bringing to you a resolution acknowledging the month of February 2024 as Black History Month. It's important to highlight Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who was born December 19, 1875, to former enslaved parents. In 1912, he earned his PhD in history from Harvard University, making him the second African American to graduate with a PhD from Harvard. He went on to become a renowned author and journalist about African American history. He believed racism could be overcome through education. He was aware of pre-existing celebrations and was asking the public to extend their study of black history. Because of his efforts to promote African American history, he became known as the father of black history. He's also the person who helped start Black History Month. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified uh, School District recognizes that Black History Month is the opportunity to promote and foster cultural relevance in our schools and enrich the educational experiences of our students to deepen their understanding of the different perspectives of African American history, excuse me, of American history. Whereas PBSD recognizes that current research supports the positive effect of ethnic studies courses and other culturally relevant approaches to engage and motivate higher academic performance of all students. Therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees acknowledges February 2024 as Black History Month and recognizes the significance of Black History Month as an important time to acknowledge and celebrate the contributions of Ameri African Americans in the nation's history. So we'd really like for you to approve this resolution. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? Oh, excuse me, no speakers. <clears throat> Thank you. And I will bring it back to the board. For discussion, comments? Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you in full support of this resolution. It was really beautiful to see um, our friends from Pajaro Valley High School here tonight mm -hmm. in remembrance of Martin Luther King. And I think we all sort of neglected to say that earlier in our board comments about Martin Luther King Day and the day of service that many of us performed in. Um, so anyway, thank you for bringing this forward and I'd like to make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa and Trustee Dr. Holm. Any other comments? No? Okay, seeing then, I will call for a vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing then, the vote motion. <laughs> Sorry, the vote passes 7 0 0. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you. My mic off. Moving on to item 8.5, this is to approve and adopt the PBUSD instructional calendars for 
the 2024-2025 school year, the 2025-2026 school year, and the 2026-2027 school year. And this report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, our Assistant Superintendent of HR. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. So before you tonight are the final drafts of the school calendars for the next three school years. Um, we presented the first reading at the December 6th meeting. We received no notification to have them amended, so therefore they are before you tonight for approval. So I respectfully request that you approve the next three school year calendars. Thank you. Um, do we have any public comments this ever? Any public comments? No. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Okay, sorry. Any comments, discussion from the board? Trustee DeServa? Can you highlight the pertinent changes that we would need to know about in this the new pertinent schedule? Cha oh, sorry. That's okay. I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. Um, the pertinent change is that we are having a full week off for Thanksgiving. Everything else is pretty much status quo. That's the change. Is, can I, is that for all three years? Yes. Starting with the 2024? Starting with the 24-25 school year. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I have another question. Because mm -hmm. I get these questions from other parts mm -hmm. of, our, of um, the county where we might have a teacher teaching here but having mm -hmm. living somewhere yep. else and have kids in other districts. Mm -hmm. did, did we try to align with some of the other districts in terms of the spring breaks and winter breaks and all that? Good question. So spring breaks, yes. We, I checked whatever calendars were available. There was an agreement quite a few years back between all of the superintendents that they would try to align to have the, f the spring break be the first full week of April to address exactly what you're bringing up as well as address the testing schedules so that we had some consistency with our testing schedules for the CASP. Um, and I believe Santa Cruz City Schools was the only one that had a calendar. Everyone else was kind of in the same position that we are where they're having to go and look or do the next three years out. So we, for next school year, we are in alignment with the calendar that was available. Um, and then once ours are published, then the other districts can also look at ours and they can align. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Serpa. Any other questions or comments? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to table it. <laughs> I, if none, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. Thank you, Trustee. Dr. Second. Hall? Okay, we have a first and we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The carries 7 0. Um, moving on to 8.6 school accountability report card. The report will be presented by our assistant superintendent of secondary education, Ms. Lisa Agetti. Welcome. Good evening, President Acosta and Board of Trustees and interim superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. Um, this evening I bring you the annual school accountability report cards. Uh, every year by February, February 1st, uh, we must uh, update the school accountability report cards, bring them to the board to ask for approval to have them posted on our websites. And so that is why um, I am here this evening. And so the purpose of the school accountability report card also um, called the SARC is to inform the community and families about how schools are doing. Essentially, it is each individual school's report card. The majority of the SARCs are um, automatically filled in with data that comes from the uh, state, and uh, some of the information is filled in from the school principal. Each section may pertain to a different year. Some of the sections, um, for example, the first one about the schools. It pertains to this year, 23-24. Some sections are about for school year 21-22, such as the teacher credential information. Some sections are 22-23, and some um, are for this year. So there are five sections. One, about the school. Two, conditions of learning, which is about the teacher credential information, the school facility conditions, and textbooks. Um, pupil outcomes, which is your academic data, as well as um, the physical fitness test. Engagement, which is opportunities for parent involvement, dropout, graduation rates, as well as suspensions, attendance, and expulsions. And the last section is other information. And so um, those are the five areas in the SARC, which align with the eight state priorities. And with that, I ask for your approval to have the school accountability report cards posted on our district website. Thank you. 
Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for comments, questions, discussion. Yes, Trustee Dr. Holm. I move to approve. All right, I have a motion. A second. And I have a second. Are there any other questions or comments from the board before I call for a vote? Seeing none, okay. And I will now call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. The vote passes 7-0. Thank you. Moving on to item 8.7, approve notice of award for the Pajaro Middle School Flood Restoration Project number 2023062. This report will be presented by our Director of Maintenance Operations and Facilities, our very own Hernando Fernandez. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, President Acosta, Intern Superintendent Shekman, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Rindo Fernandez, and I'm here to bring this project forward. Um, this is for the Pajaro Middle School Restoration Project. This is an, a FEMA-funded project, general and restricted funding project. So back in December 8th and December 15th, that we advertised for this project. We had a mandatory bid walk on December 19th. 16 contractors were present that day. January 16, we did a bid opening. Four sealed bids were presented that day. And as you can see here on, on the board, the lowest bidder was Avila Construction. But they messed up on their numbers, so they withdraw their bid. So we had to go to the, move on to the next bidder, which was Osanio Inc. from Castroville, with a price of $4,600,000. So I'm asking the approval to continue with the contract with Osonio for the power restoration project for four million six hundred thousand dollars. Thank you, Hernando. Uh, do we have any public comment on this? We have no speakers. All right. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Any questions, comments, or discussion from the board? I do. So we have contingency uh, money just in case we come back with some change orders down the road? 10%. 10%? Yeah. And then the tentative start date? Tentative start date, uh, as soon as we get this um, approved. approved by the board, we're going to hold a pre-con meeting on site so we could kick off and get the contractors going because we need to finish and open up that site. That's our goal. All right. And all... Uh, water um, control systems are already in place in case of any uh, future flooding because we do have some storms lined up so that's all been uh, factored in correct everything you know the drains have been cleaned on the site and we did what we can there so I mean other than raising those foundations up and put them on steels or something like that then I don't think we have the money and capable of doing that we we done all we can there. Yeah, and the county's already cleaned out all the gutters, right? And, yeah. And the DIs in the area. Correct. Yeah. They've been cleaning down in Salinas Road and down in you know Pajaro area, so they've all been right. working at it. All right. Well, God bless and good luck, and hopefully we don't have any problems. Yeah. We don't. We don't need another one. Se right. Second time, third time. I don't know if we could handle that. Vice President Soto, would you like to make a motion to approve this item? Yeah. This is. Uh, my school, my area, and you know it's uh, it's been on standby for quite a bit, and probably something what of an inconvenience, maybe maybe not for, you know I want to thank Lakeview for accommodating the students as well, and and the uh, district as well for making that decision. But uh, it's time to get the kids back and let's get this done. So yeah, I make a motion to support. And I'd I'd like to go ahead and just second that if I could, since um, my trustee area is as in one of my schools housing Pajaro um, Middle school students not that we don't love them but I agree with uh, trust vice president Soto's sentiment we I'm sure those people uh, are middle stu middle school students would like to get back to their own school and so and not have to be riding a bus to school and being but be able to walk in. again yeah so uh, thank you everyone for allowing us to do that and um trustee Bolano scout just a quick question uh, how confident on you are you on a scale 
from one to ten, with ten being the most confident, one being the least confident, that the kids are going to be there in August. Ten, very confident. Woo! Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be there. I'm gonna go for it. We we owe we owe it to the kids, and we gotta open up that school. I mean, that was one of the schools I attended from K through eight. So, I was there. I attended there, and my kids went there. So that's I live in that area. That's my community too. So. I want to get those kids back in school. They deserve it. And, you know, they'll be happy when they come back. And I, I just also want to say, I drive through there regularly and frequently, multiple times in a week, and the painting is just, that we're seeing coming along is just amazing, so. Yeah, and it's it's hard right now, just the weather is not really permitting right. us to do the, you know, what we want to do, but I know we're going to be getting some good weather, so hopefully we could really improve that that look pretty soon here so well, it'll come you. around thank you for all the work your team is doing yeah, to help no that. i'm sorry trustee de serpa hi so can you tell us about the field the field i know we just sort of launched a public service campaign to try to raise money for the fields but can you say more about it yeah the fields like we had it tested to see what what was in there and if anything, we're gonna go in there, you know, mow the fields, irrigate, fertilize, and seed. If we don't come up with the money to do the turf field, um, so the fields will be good for the kids to return back. If we don't get the money, if we don't raise the money to go with the nasser turf. So if we if we end up raising enough money to put in some really nice infrastructure there on the fields, what are what are we uh, dreaming for? Is it soccer fields? Is it baseball diamond? Like what are we hoping for on those fields? It'll be a track and field. Yeah. Oh, it'll be a track and a field. Awesome. Okay, and about how much money will we need to raise? I was just going to ask, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask uh, Superintendent Shackman to speak to this because he had made some comments about this in Intergovernmental Relations Committee, and he and I have had but a conversation about it. I just want you to know that uh, Herlindo and I and Sergio Ambris, his assistant director, have been working very closely. We need a million and a half. We identified 500000 in the district. We're going to raise the money. We're going to. We're going to. We're going to. We're going to put in a field, Hurley and I have talked about this, and it's not going to be, they're not going to put in a grass field in case we don't raise the money. They're going to put in a grass field because we won't be able to build a synthetic turf field by the time the kids will be there at the school. That's yeah. just a fact of life. But we're going to raise the money, so the plan is we test it for, we test the, uh, the field uh, because it was flooded, we plant grass, kids can play ball, and we will you know, have a timeline to put in the turf. And I have made a commitment to the people in this community and the people who've asked me about it. My time is limited in the district, but if the money's not there, I'm gonna hang around until we raise that money. Pajaro Middle School kids and you know, their families, they were flooded twice in the last 30 years, and what a delight to put a synthetic turf field as the center of the community of Pajaro, just like the field we have at Iejo. Correct. So that's the plan. And we're going to do it. That's great. So I've asked the Aptos Sports Foundation to help, and they're looking for money, and the Wharf to Wharf should help. So, so I been, haven't reached out to, to them, but we but should. They've reached out to me, and they're working that's, on it. That's great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to let you know that the architects who've done a lot of work for us also donated the design phase for the field. So That's they're doing that fantastic. for Fantastic, really great. Wow. We're gonna get, we have a lot of support already. People, people wanna do this. That's great. Um, I'll just reiterate what I've said before. Um, uh, Mr. Sheckman um, and I spoke at um, the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. They were slated to give us $2 million for this project and ended up giving us zero. Yeah. So I've called uh, Glenn Church, who's the supervisor for that area. He should be ashamed of himself. Um, and um, I encourage all these board members to continue to call him um, to let him know how we feel about this because it, um, their own staff recommended a $2 million um, donation, not a donation, but a $2 million, um, what would you call it, allocation um, to 
our district, and unfortunately, um, that did not happen. Thank you, Trustee DeServa. Trustee Dodge Jr. I just wanted to follow up with Trustee DeServa. Was there a reason why? Do we know why? What I heard him say is that, well, the Pajaro Valley has a huge um, budget and we there, don't need the money. If I could try and address it, I'll, I'll defend them a little. $20 million was provided by the state of California in an emergency fund for Pajaro. That's a drop in the bucket. For the infrastructure that's needed for that community, 20 million was spent overnight. The people in that community had the perception that the district would find the money elsewhere. And so they worked on the supervisors to convince them that the money should go directly to people in the community. And that is what is happening. And I don't know an area that has greater need. So we get up the next day and we say, all right, that's understandable, but we still need to build that field, and we will. You know, politics plays a role, but when the press asked me, are you disappointed, Mr. Sheckman? And I responded, of course I am, but 20 million is a drop in the bucket. It's okay, we'll make it happen. And you're all gonna help, right on Helica? Thank you, sorry. Uh, we, we already have a first and a second, but any other, um, are there any other discussion, comments from the board before I call for a vote? No? Okay. Then I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The vote carries 7-0. Thank you, Herlindo. Thank, Thank you, you for enduring all of our questions and comments. No problem. And concerns. Thank you. Um, so now we will move to our last report and discussion item, 9.1, our annual McKinney Vento report. This report will be presented by our coordinator of student service, says Ben Slider. Welcome, Ben. Good evening, Board President Acosta, Board Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman, and the PVUSD community. I'll be presenting the annual McKinney Vento report by focusing on three data areas, grades, attendance, and discipline. So if we take a look at this slide, um, just for reference, uh, grade point average four through one, A through F. What I wanna highlight in this particular slide um, is a couple things, but first, Q2 means quarter two, Q4 means quarter four. Q2 is like semester one or quarter two. Q4 is semester two or quarter four and Q1 is quarter one, it's just um, to give you a little bit of reference. But if we take a look at 22-23, quarter two, McKinney-Vento students in grades six through eight, they had an average grade point average of 2.77. And if we take a look at um, this year at quarter one, we didn't have quarter two grades just yet because they're, they're not fully uh, inputted and due uh, by the time I created this uh, presentation. Uh, that grade level, was, uh, shows a 2.82, which shows growth between quarter two of last year and quarter two of this year. If we take a look at um, the McKinney-Vento students 9 through 12, uh, 2.27 uh, in quarter two of last year, and now in this year we have 2.41, so we're also seeing some growth there with their overall average grade point averages. Um, and then you can see for comparison all PVOSD students both in six through eight and nine through 12. Uh, next is attendance. So we take a look at the attendance. Um, I wanna highlight um, these two quarters here. So quarter two of last year and quarter two of this year. And across the board, TK fifth, um, we see that there is an increased percentage of um, attendance rate uh, 89 uh, to 93, so that's great. That's a significant gain there. Um, sixth through eighth, uh, our McKinney-Vento students um, showed 88%, uh, and this year, 91. And then ninth grade, 89.77 to 90.83. And just for reference, when we look at all McKinney-Vento uh, metrics together, uh, last year, 89.3 five compared to this year 92.03 so we're seeing an increase in positive attendance rates and then as um, you can see for reference comparison to all 
PVUSD students. This is the same information, just in graphical form, and so you can see the difference in heights of the, um, the different quarters as well. And we're able to, um, to show the quarter to grades or attendance from this year because um, I was able to run the report at the end of the semester. And then finally, I wanted to share um, where we are uh, with um, suspensions and expulsions. Um, comparing between uh, the, the three academic years as well. So 21-22, if we take a look at the table down below, um, when we're looking at McKinney-Vento students, um, each of these percentages or numbers are about um, a student receiving at least one suspension. So they're not total number of suspensions, but the number of students that have received at least one suspension. So. 21-22 academic year, there were 71 McKinney-Vento students that received at least one suspension, or 4.41% of all the McKinney-Vento students received a suspension. Um, in 22-23, it was 83 for the whole academic year, or 4.77. And as of 12-20, so at the end of last semester, um, when I pulled this data, we had 48 or 2.5. And so um, typically what we see is that there, is, uh, there, are, there are times that students do um, have multiple suspensions, so we'll keep an eye on that and um, work towards um, making sure that uh, we try to keep that number down. So when we take a look at um, overall students, you know, 666 um, in 2021-22 or 3.22, 3.73 and 22-23 and 2.09. So we do see that the difference is that there's slightly higher rates of suspension rates for McKinney-Vento students compared to all students. And so we'll work on um, putting in our interventions and our tier one supports to be able to support students you know, around that. Um, for this year at this point, McKinney-Vento students, there haven't been any expulsions um, yet. And um, that's a, a host, a list of all of the supports that our Healthy Start uh, program um, provides uh, directly to our uh, McKinney-Vento families. And with that, um, any questions? Do we have um, any public speakers to this item? We have no speakers. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Any questions, comments, or discussion from the board? Trustee Bolano scow how, how many kids and families are we talking about here? So um, it, it does shift from year to year, but currently right now we have somewhere around 1,961 um, students that we serve that are, have some form of McKinney-Vento status. 9,000? 1,961. That number shifts because sometimes we have students and families that move out of our area. So, and just for anybody watching who's a little bit confused, we're talking about people without homes? We're talking about people who have some sort of um, situation where they're under sheltered or they're in substandard um, housing or they're, they, they don't have a place to live um, or they're currently living in a shelter or in a hotel or um, something like that. So there's a list of um, what qualifies a family uh, to be eligible. How do you define substandard? I don't define well, substandard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there is an empathetic interview that our Healthy Start registration technicians do perform when they um, contact families. So we might get some word that there's a family that's in need. We will reach out to them. And then based on um, a list of um, criteria, they, they'll ask some questions, they're empathetic in their interview, and then they make that determination whether or not they um, are eligible for Healthy Start services. That's all for now, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Trustee Bolano scow <laughs> Anyone else? Any other points? <laughs> Trustee DeSerpa? Okay. So they, they do this empathetic interview, they mm -hmm. find out, they qualify them for Healthy Start, <clears throat> and then what kind of services are offered to, to help get them into better housing? 
Um, well, we, we will either um, connect them with community partners that are able to either provide rent assistance or be able to connect them to housing. Um, most of that kind of work um, is going to happen on the ground and either our registration technicians will reach out to these community organizations on their behalf find that information and help to connect the two, um, the, you know, the family and the community organization, organization together. Or if it's within our means, um, we'll also be able to um, reach out and give them that um, information in terms of what kind of options that are out there. Do the Healthy Start technicians use the referral program that we adopted? which is the, I think the closed loop referral. Yep, the Unitas referral. Yeah, yes. so are they able to use that and yes. make those referrals yep. for housing yep. assistance? Okay. Yeah. Because 1,900 is a lot of kids. It is a lot. And those are the ones that are within our Synergy program that are in our PVSD programs. We also support their whole family as well, which could also include someone that was just born to maybe three or four, but not in one of our PVSD programs. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't include those numbers either. When you, when you include those numbers, then it gets past um, uh, 2,000. Yeah, so you add another um, couple hundred to that. So I would like to figure out a way for us to partner um, with some of the homeless service programs if we're not already because all over the county we're going to be required to build tremendous amounts of affordable housing upcoming. And the state is enforcing this. Um, like 5,000 units in the unincorporated area and probably a similar amount in the city of Watsonville. So um, hopefully we can get families on the wait list for these units. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you, Ben, for okay. being here this evening and during the, the comments and All right, questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ben. All right. Um, sorry, moving on to our consent agenda. Um, these consent items are routine items that um, come before the board for the board's approval. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? Uh, we do not. Are there any items on the consent agenda that any board member would wish to defer? Trustee Do Just quickly, if we could just elaborate on 10.14. I think you'll have, I have to a question defer for it you. then. Or Lindo. Would you like to approve the agenda with deferring 10.14? Uh, I would like to make a motion to support this agenda, deferring 10.14. Okay. Can I have a second? A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? Um, the motion carries 7-0 with 10.14 uh, deferred. And I believe Herlindo's come up to maybe okay. ask so, your questions. This has been haunting me since 1996 along with Mr. Sheckman and I know Trustee Scow has heard about it too. So this HVAC system, is there gonna be heating in the auditorium? Does this help alleviate? Because I know some of you have seen emails about it's too hot, it's too cold. Does this help in any way? Out of your hall? Yes. Yeah. The the HVAC system in out of hall in the main building is going to be replaced. Okay. But th does that... I'm not sure, Mr. Sheckman, do you know how the auditorium, like, is there a heat, like, I know it gets too cold, is, it, is this going to? Well, so, <laughs> well, here's, here's a, here, here, okay, here's a problem at Hall in the auditorium. It's a big space. Yeah. They don't really inform us when they're going to use it. They inform us when they're already in there, and it's going to take a while for that place to heat up. They do have big units up there, two big units serving that, that auditorium. So if if we would know ahead of time, we could schedule it so that it could warm up because that place does take a while. And being an old building, windows are not really energy efficient. So that place really, you know, from being in the 40s, yes. you know, it's going <laughs> to take a while for that space to heat up. So if we don't like to heat up spaces when they're not being used just for energy savings 
but if we had a schedule that's why we have a schedule and i believe now we're we still have a schedule but they do have a thermostat on the wall that they could control their their own heating systems so it'll be but then again you know it's not going to heat up right away mm -hmm. so that's that's all i can say on that well I just you know thank you for getting this i know it's an old school you know my grandparents went there as well but we're trying you know so we're investing as much as we can so i just wanted to say thank you. and that's one of the lucky schools that they do have ac in there and that school so a lot of our sites don't have air conditioning oh that one does have air conditioning and heating so they're kind of lucky in that point that's what we're going back with so well, thank you very much um i'd like to make a motion to support agenda item 10.14 thank you I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and that carries seven zero. Thank you, Herlinda, for asking, answering the questions. Thank, on you. That. thank you. And um, uh, uh, sorry, moving on to um, item thirteen, action report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Yes, there are. Um, so as of tonight's meeting, January 24th, 2024, uh, from closed session, item 2.1, expulsion referrals. So under closed session agenda, item 2.1, uh, the board voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 23-24 academic year for student number 2324-008. Uh, the board voted five to one to one to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for one calendar year for student number 2324-009. The board voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 23-24 academic year for student number 2324-010. Uh, the board voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 23-24 academic year for student number 2324-011. The board voted 511 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a full expulsion for one calendar year for student number 2324-012. The board voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a full expulsion for one calendar year for student number 2324-013. The board voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a full expulsion for one calendar year for student number 2324-014. And the board also voted 601 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for one calendar year for student number 2324-015. Uh, motion number one in closed session under item 2.2. So I move to approve the certified professional personnel report as presented by district administration on January 24th, 2024 with a 21 and 10 additional action items. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> vote car motion carries, vote carries seven zero zero. All right, motion number two under closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on January 24th, 2024 with 42 and eight additional action items. Can I get a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Vote carries seven zero. All right, closed session item 2.7, liability claim. The board of trustees voted 601 to reject a liability claim. Closed session item 2.8, special education settlement. The Board of Trustees voted 601 to approve the settlement. And we have one announcement. 
Uh, PBUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Mayra Fernandez to the position of Coordinator of Child Welfare and Attendance. Ms. Fernandez has been serving students in PVUSD since 2006 as an elementary bilingual education teacher at both Freedom and Ohlone schools. She has served as the academic coordinator at Calabasas Elementary and Hall District. Most recently, she has been serving as the principal of Hall District since 2018. Uh, Ms. Fernandez holds a bachelor's degree in sociology with a social service emphasis and a minor in Chicano studies from UC Davis. Uh, she also earned a master's of arts in teaching and multiple subject teaching credential with a B-clad from Beth Universe Bethany University. Her master's in educational administration and administrative credential were earned at Santa Clara University. And Ms. Fernandez is also a graduate of Watsonville High School, and it's always act exciting to have a PVUSD grad take on such an important role in the district. So with that, we are excited to miss welcome Ms. Fernandez to her new role. Congratulations, Maida. Is that all? That is everything. Thank you, Vice President Soto. Uh, moving to item 14.1, uh, board meetings are ne the board's next uh, meeting is a special board meeting uh, next week on January 31st, uh, 2024, to review superintendent applications. And the board's next regular board meeting is on February 14th, 2024, so cancel those Valentine's Day plans. And with that, I will move to item 15. The meeting is adjourned at 10.23 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Thank you all. All right, you can keep it. Yeah, if you want it. Huh? <laughs> Very nice.